Hello friends, and welcome to the first installment of Poetry Friday. This is the series where I read you my poetry, as the title would suggest. Before we get started with today's poem, I want to quickly give some context and a trigger warning for this particular poem. This poem is modeled after a brilliant poem by Anne Sexton. She was an American poet during the 60s that wrote in a very intimate, confessional style. Her poems often explored her mental illness, her relationship with her husband, and ultimately give us a window into who she was as a person. I encourage you to go and read her work. The way she crafts stanzas is breathtaking. My poem today is inspired and hopefully pays homage to her poem, Little Red Riding Hood, which is found in her poetry collection, Transformations. I do warn you that my version is dark, just like its source material, so trigger warnings are listed below. Please enjoy. The Little Mermaid, in the style of Anne Sexton's Little Red Riding Hood. Many remain silent. The skinny cashier, tired behind the counter, eyes glazed as to not notice the mother, with her three kids and a cart full of spam and juice boxes. Meanwhile, she clutches her youngest tight to her breast, shame a wriggling snake in her stomach, fingers trembling around her crucifix, preparing to perish for the candies in her pocket, unpaid for, a luxury she'll devour in private, before heading to the church and crossing herself in holy water. A seemingly friendly man with hazel eyes sits next to little Clara, not so little, and shows her a faded photo, says it's his wife, and promises Clara he only wants to talk. If she'll give him ten minutes, they'll be fast friends. She's quiet on the mattress, covered with dry grease stains and wet ones. Clara scrubs her skin raw and bleeding, but clean. The man with hazel eyes takes her virginity and disappears. Where is the moral? Not all tongues are for wagging and kissing, lips open and close, puckering like a fish. Little Clara has lost her belief in words, and now she has no wastebasket in which to keep her strength. The football coach on national television, who never screams on the field, straightens his tie in front of the cameras, and promises green-studded futures for poverty-stricken boys, hungry for more, fills their yawning mouths with his cock in the tiled showers perfumed with bleach, a power in his hand like a whip, walls opaque and silent save for the pitter-patter, pitter-patter. And then the climax, as simple as cracking open a beer and the salty tears are swept away under the spray, pitter-patter, pitter-patter. And I, I too, quite loud in the center of the room, until a man cringes, turns to his golf buddy. Mother sweeps in, closes my lips with a pinch, just out of bit of color, she murmurs, my tongue, poor lady, wiggling behind my wall of pearly whites with a quiver of restlessness. The tongue, that toughened shoe leather, running panicked through the streets, never stopping one foot after the other, one hour after the other, until she is swallowed with the saliva, and it's all over. And I, I too again, I bought a pair of noise-canceling headphones, renewed my meditation app service, and began... There was no silence. Inside, I still scream. When I laid on my bed, scratchy wool on my legs and elbows, the train growled on its tracks, stacks puffing with white plumes, gaining speed, and each rumble broke, shattered like bones. My memories, that hazy cloud, sat in the cobwebs, feet kicked up and white wine swirling. Forgetting is not a mercy. Even in the bathroom, there was only an illusion of silence. The train was rattling through the woods, coal dusting the tops and slicing me in half on its iron wheels. The kitchen was stale with the crackle of the old radio, and I could not move to another house where voices make a worthy home. Long ago there was a peculiar silence. Five sisters gave their hair for a voice, a kind of martyr. In the beginning, a little girl looked up through frosted glass to the swirling sun-scattered ripples and hoped to feel the light not just its poor cousin fractured by water's cold touch. She had five older sisters, so she was called Little, and instead of legs, a blanket of shimmering scales wrapped her hips, flowing into a fan of citrine and glazed with moon pearls. It was her fingerprint, unique only to her. She was known everywhere and coveted by mermen, with hungry gazes, yes, starving, as if they'd never tasted shark. But the more she grew, the smaller the ocean became, especially as her sisters rose to the surface each year on their birthday, returning with stories of the sky, the green beyond the sandbar, 
the white sails. On her fifteenth birthday, bloated with longing and hope, she rose easily to the surface, bubbles of excitement around her. How did she breathe when she crested? Did her lungs panic and her throat close? How long did she linger, afraid, under the wavy glass of the ocean? Did her gills retract under her sea-toughened skin? But she lifted above the water. Her eyes feasted upon the expanse of wine-dark sea and sun-bleached sky, a bobbing boat not far with sleek white lines and hip-hop music blasting. Her warm sun turned to storm-thrashed skies, quick, sinking the yacht. She saved only one, a shivering boy who choked on water as she had choked on air. They lay side by side on the sand until church bells rang on high, and the little mermaid scuttled into the sea as the boy woke up in the arms of the pastor's daughter, her legs as white as lilies. In the depths of the cold ocean she burned, so a sea wizard came to her, fat with greed and his throat raspy, probably from eating too many swordfish. He offered the little mermaid a human life, a pair of lily-white legs for the small on-sale price of her tongue and voice. Clutching her throat, wanting the sun and the white boat, she nodded. Poor, unfortunate soul, the sea wizard murmured, laid poised against the back of her throat, sawing out her wiggling tongue. The little mermaid soothed the sting with her human potion. Her citrine tail, her thumbprint unraveled as she swam to the surface. She burst from the waves, this time gasping, as the ocean stole her air. A sword straightened her spine, prickled along the soles of her feet, television static in her new legs. On the beach she massaged, hoping the feeling would vanish, but she only experienced agony. The little mermaid cried out, but no sound escaped. She crawled, too weak to walk, towards the church, toward the sun, toward the world, toward adventure. But no bells rang. She was left in silence, wanting to be rescued. She could not scream for help. She could not walk. She could not go back. Until her five sisters crested the waves and gave her a dagger. Their heads, shining eggs, should have given her hope. But she cradled the dagger, crawling on her hands and knees, face wet with tears, cheeks red, sandy grit on her skin. She drew a red smile across her throat and collapsed, lifeless on the sand. The ocean bubbled up, rising with her sister's tears, the waves carrying her seafoam ashes into the riptide. There is nothing to bury, nothing to mourn, when she silences herself.